It is December the 3rd, 2021, and you are listening to Curiously Polar. Hello and welcome back. I'm Chris. Uh, there is Mario. And I'm Mario. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, here. How's it going yeah. today? It's going. It's going really nice. It's uh, minus nine already now for a, a long time. We have had uh, very low temperature, at least a week. Okay. And uh, it's nice and crispy. And today it, there is not a cloud in the sky. Plus that tonight there is going to be a big corona hole and we are expecting really exceptional northern lights. So looking forward to going out tonight. And oh, wonderful. Look at those. Wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have an. Ep- How's it going yeah, down there? <laughs> it's it's okay. It's okay. It's the it's the pre-Christmas frenzy going on. Mm-hmm. So, um, with everything that comes with it, and they're juggling a lot of things. Okay. But yes. hey, we we managed to get this episode out, and then mm. we are probably planning for one more before the end of the year. And uh, yeah, we have news, like Arctic news, polar news. Right. Yes. What's happening up here and down there? You've um, put a lot of yeah. interesting stuff together for today. Let's start with uh, with one that An is not very visual. <laughs> All we have is <laughs> this article without pictures. Uh, the Arctic, yes. the Antarctic Treaty is the Antarctic Treaty. We start down south to start with today, and um, the first of December was the. Uh, 67 62nd anniversary of the Antarctic Treaty of the uh, actual acceptance of this Antarctic Treaty uh-huh. it was then signed uh, by the uh, initial 12 countries uh, a little later but uh, well, it was uh, it was ratified a little later but uh, it was signed on the 1st of December in 59 and this is uh, a world first um at that time, it was not um, it was not normal to agree not to colonize or not to take possession for your own country of a territory. Hmm. So it's the first uh, territory where uh, on the first land or piece of land uh, that is uh, truly international. It's not even a protectorate like like one would say Spitzbergen or the uh, Svalbard area, which is, yeah, international, like lots of countries can have access to it, but it is still managed by Norway. In this case, in Antarctica, it is not the case. Antarctica is truly international. Yeah, we have we've talked about this in, in previous episodes. Like it's it's kind of sliced into like pieces of cake, you know, little quadrants... Yeah, more and more for practical and historical reasons because right. the different bases. I mean, of course, you want like Australia; they have easier access to the piece of Antarctica that is closest to them, right? And uh, and the same with Chile and Argentina, and uh, and we have uh, of course uh, discussed about the uh, like claims to the territory and whatnot, and uh, like different uh, activities that might take place on there, but. Uh, it, the uh, the important part of the treaty. I mean, the first three articles are extremely telling, and uh, and hopefully this is something that will last and it will be an example also for other areas. But first of all, Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only, and this is the first article. So, no militarization of Antarctica, and no, not only no militarization, but also no quarrels should happen in Antarctica and we're talking about the Antarctic soil and the area around Antarctica so the uh, Falkland War and the claims over South Georgia they don't encompass the Antarctic Treaty we are outside of the area of the area there right and uh, and then uh, the uh, the second article is about uh, scientific cooperation and that Antarctica is a place for freedom of scientific investigation and cooperation so all uh, data should be made available which is then in article 3 and uh, it should be freely accessible and uh, and also the uh, the fact that uh, that there is this huge uh, 
underlining of the science in Antarctica is is extremely is extremely important, and uh, and, and this has shaped the uh, let's say the human presence in Antarctica, uh, with uh, maybe the few notable exceptions of the expeditions to cross Antarctica or these uh, like feats that uh, have been somehow put under the auspices of any of a scientific framework. Because when you're crossing Antarctica, you are crossing it also for like gathering data either on what humans can do or about what Antarctica looks like. And this is this is really nice. Uh, to that, I might just uh, also say that it's not that f when, you, when we are saying it's freedom of scientific investigation, doesn't mean that anybody can go there and just do whatever they... <laughs> One. There are rules. Rules need to be there followed. Are, there are rules. <laughs> uh, let's say that all scientific uh, scientific investigation has to undergo some sort of approval by the respective government of uh, of authority. So, for example, from Norway, if you are a Norwegian scientist or you're you're like starting off from Norway, you will have to ask Norway as a signatory of the Antarctic Treaty to approve of going to Antarctica for your project and what right. you're going to be doing, which is somehow also guaranteeing that there is a, a um, uh, that there is there are like some sort of sound scientific basis for going, that there is a financing, there are insurances and all the things that are needed also to come out of there and uh, and like environmental protection, like what right. you do with your with your with your equipment, with the uh, with the garbage that is being produced necessarily by being there. So, so how many in, countries like, have a presence in Antarctica? Do we know that? It, there must be a list somewhere. It is somewhere. 54 at the moment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the Out of 100 of and to, whatever. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the the there is uh, a, um, uh, like, you are not a member of the Antarctic Treaty if you are not actually active scientifically mm -hmm. in Antarctica. So it requires some sort of financing of going there. And for the renegotiation in the Antarctic Treaty in the in the uh, in the nineties, then uh, there was a number of other countries that have tried to establish uh, scientific uh, scientific expeditions and uh, and therefore claim for a place in Antarctica. There is also one thing that is also interesting is that Antarctica should be free, free from nuclear activities. You say it should be. Yes, because like it depends on the interpretation of the article. I think it was it is article of four or something that uh, when we are talking about uh, about uh, uh, nuclear activities, I mean war. Warheads, yes, I think that everybody is uh, is actually agreeing on keeping nuclear warheads out of Antarctica. But how about nuclear powered vessels? Nuclear icebreakers, that kind of stuff. A nuclear icebreaker. Uh -huh. Or how about a nuclear power plant? Because especially now that we are talking about climate and emissions of CO2, if you are looking at powering a station during the winter, where there is no sunlight and uh, maybe when there is a wind there is too much of it and when there is no wind there is no energy and when there's no sun very solar panels don't work yeah, yeah. Mm. so how to how to power uh, in, like in a way that is not emitting greenhouse gases giant how to hamster power wheels a station down there yeah so mm. so there is uh, there are there are a few few things up for debate on whether to keep nuclear power totally out of Antarctica or just the nuclear weapons. And it's so remote, it's not easy to put an undersea power cable there. But or is I don't know if you notice, like we don't have it in the news, but Chile is now planning an, an internet cable from Chile down across the Drake I've to read the Antarctic this. Peninsula. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. So there might be, it might be soon... A fiber another part of a fiber optic cable that might be soon high speed internet from F at least an a FTTA of cable fiber to the Arctic uh, Antarctic. Oh well, 
Yes. Okay. A little bit like like the cable coming up to New Orleans in Svalbard, which is yes. like some of the fastest internet you can get on the globe. <laughs> Still crazy because New Orleans is so remote. Um, yes, exactly. So, how, so much for the Antarctic Treaty and how about the happy let anniversary. Me, let's look up in the sky as the next mm. item on the list because we have another another celestial phenomenon going on exactly and there. that's that's something really exciting there is a going to be a total solar eclipse on december 4th so today is december 3rd so tomorrow a total solar eclipse in the early morning of tomorrow uh universal time and uh, around 7 30 it's it's at its maximum and uh, it is visible down south so the uh <laughs> If you yeah, if you get this uh, this uh, this graphics here, you can see that there is a green sun yeah. just over the Weddell Sea in Antarctica, and yeah. then there is this uh, um, this uh, this these, corridor uh, of blue lines, blue dark there, yes. blue lines. Well, that is the path of the eclipse of the total eclipse. So the total eclipse will start somehow east of the Falkland Islands and then it would swing over South Georgia and down into the Weddell Sea over the uh, over the Antarctic Peninsula and out towards uh, towards like the uh, the West Antarctica and uh, and of course there are there are some partial eclipses and as far as South Africa and Tasmania we're going to be seeing a little bit of the uh, a little bit of the eclipse, but the best place to be, if you see it from this map, is Antarctica and especially the Weddell Sea. And there are quite a lot of expedition ships that are going to be down there. I don't remember Henry's plans, Henry's plans, but I hope he's that somewhere he's down going there. To be down there. Moment, I think yes. I think that he's supposed to be in South Georgia, because that's a place where people would be able to go on land and and see. And hopefully they're going to be having good weather because uh, a, a solar eclipse with a cloudy sky. Well, if it's total, you see, of course, the uh, the darkness, but uh, but you're not going to be able to appreciate. It's, fully. it's really interesting. Um, I, I I find it fascinating that people have such a fascination with this uh, phenomenon, which happens regularly. It happens all the time, pretty much, and and it's it's yeah. just the shadow of the moon going in front of the sun during daytime oh, yeah. and uh and of course it does it makes this corridor through the earth and people take really long trips sometimes to see it um yeah. i have witnessed one solar eclipse one total solar eclipse in my life and yeah. it was an interesting experience um but after that, my personal did fascination you, is more like, yeah, it's interesting. Did you did you uh, did you experience this thing that I've heard uh, happens with all the birds start yes. stop singing? And yes, it went quiet. It went dark. It was like night during day. Um, not quite yeah. night. It was more like twilight kind of thing. Yeah. And then um, things went quiet, and uh, the wind died down. So that's interesting. It ended up well. <laughs> the wind is solar powered, right? It's it's the heat, yeah. um, making yeah. things move. And what I like is is this uh, this way in this article. So whoever's watching the video right now uh, in EarthSky.org, there's this uh, photo by let me see via Tanakrit Santikunaporn, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it's this. It's this time lapse in one photo where uh, the person shooting that ended up doing like a time lapse every few minutes, uh, another shot, and then compositing that into one photo. So you get not just an idea of the the, the path of the sun, but also the um, yeah the, the the development, the extent of the eclipse, of the ex yeah. eclipse, and then in the middle it's the corona. Where I mean, this is really really interesting because the sun and the moon are so different in distance from us, but up in the sky they are virtually the same size, and uh, that makes that solar eclipse phenomenon possible. Yeah, and how do you make uh, such a picture like this one here? Because of course, for the sun path and the the uh, like all these little suns that you see in a in a yeah. line with more or less of the shadow, 
it's several exposures at a regular distance but yes. how about the people because they have not been standing there i mean they are frozen of course because it's a frozen landscape oh, the pe- but people uh, is, is one one photo and the, that's the, one so, frame isn't so it's, it? it's yeah, a com- okay. it's a composite of all these individual sun shots plus one frame where the people look nice and so um, easy easy to make in uh, in digital but uh, more difficult if you are using film photographs yeah but digital this is super simple to make just yeah just make sure the exposure is proper on the top frame. Probably one one frame plus then all these little cutout pieces of the sun are individual. But um, yeah, that's about, about yeah, an, an hour fantastic. of work, I would think. So, okay, yeah, because the eclipse uh, here we are having a one minute and eight seconds of uh, <laughs> of uh, of eclipse, I think, <laughs> or yeah. something one or like less than two minutes of eclipse. So the, it's the um, difficult part when photographing something like this is is getting the exposure right for the different phases because uh, sun gets less and less and less <laughs> and and you can't go back so you, the sun gets less and less and less it gets less and less bright and then you have this corona and that needs a different kind of exposure and you will yeah. need some filters on the camera to block out some of the direct yeah. light um, so it's a it's well and then not not super easy. And then scientifically, it is important uh, to have these eclipses when you uh, can see uh, the effect of uh, Einstein theory of relativity and the gravitational force of the sun bending the light of the yes. from the stars in the in the back uh, behind it. So taking pictures like these, and especially like from a telescope of the sun and the, what's happening around the sun, is extremely important uh, scientifically. Yeah. Um, let's move on Very to the next good. item. BBC yes. News is talking about <laughs> about Albatross's um, divorce. <laughs> What's going on there? Yes. Now this is uh, this is a study that was uh, performed on the Falkland Islands. As you can see, there are black browed albatrosses, and it's a fantastic place down. Uh, you've been down there, Chris, haven't you? Mm, nope, I have Falklands. not been down there. No, that's one place we have to take you both. Henry I'm a and northerner. I, I'm a northerner. I've only been to the Arctic. Uh, the Antarctic is okay. still missing on my list of uh, places. Yes. To yeah. see. Well, you've been so many places up in the Arctic. I thought you've been also down yeah. in Antarctic. I didn't remember that. Sorry about that. But we'll have to, of course, do something about it. <laughs> we. Uh, but uh, the Falkland Islands are home of quite a lot of pairs of breeding black-browed albatrosses, which are very, very nice-looking albatrosses. Not the biggest ones, but uh, but still quite big birds. And they looked at more than 15,000 breeding pairs over 15 years, so about 1,000 pairs every year. That's a lot of albatrosses that need to be checked. And the albatrosses actually have a period in their development where they are trying to figure out which partner to find and then they find a partner and they usually they are sticking to the partner and uh, they are a good match for life so they every year they come back to the same place there on the Falkland Islands it's more or less the same area of the colony as well and they sit there they do their dances with a beating their beaks together and things and they make their eggs and they fertilize them and then they take they alternate in getting the food for the chicks now the problem that they found here is that the albatrosses now in recent years are actually straying from being fidel to their mate what so when they say divorce rate they are actually they're actually cheating on each other when the one is going away or uh, not arriving early enough. Well, they just find another mate, and, and that is. And you're not. saying that that has increased over the time, and that has increased, and they are actually trying to figure out. These uh, scientists, uh, uh, they were looking at uh, the divorce rate, or like what ha- what happens. Like, yeah, uh, we have an increase of the of the infidelity or like getting another mate than the one that you have been observed with before from 1%, which is your original baseline data to 8%. So oh, it's that's actually a quite noticeable. Increase. That's quite, 
quite noticeable. They are very careful in say, in phrasing this, but they're saying this is nothing compared to humans. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there are two reasons why uh, albatrosses might be going for another mate instead of waiting for their own partner. And one is that they have to, like the partner is absent for a longer period of time. So they have to fly much further out to feed themselves or to feed the chicks. So uh, so they are not arriving. So there are also like limits to the patience of an albatross waiting well, is for it, their mate. Is it patience like, or are albatrosses just a bit dim and they forget? Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing and that is not, yes. that is not what a biology should do. But there is a trade-off <laughs> between waiting for your mate and your reproductive success. So it's not that it's a calculation in there, but the instinct tells you, you got to reproduce, it's now, and then you don't have a mate. Is that mate coming back or is that mate, is a mate disappeared? So it's, it, it's uh, in the end, it yeah. comes down so to economic reasons, pretty much. At the, at the end, it is, uh, it is a trade-off, like, okay, well, it would be really nice to wait for you, darling, but, uh, but you are not, you haven't, you're not here on time, and the clock is ticking, the seasons are passing, the season is passing, and we need really to get, I need to get this egg out, and uh, it needs to be fertilized if you are a female albatross or the other way around mm -hmm. uh, for a male. So th this is one problem, and and of course this is the, uh, the 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 flying away is because the waters are of a different temperature. So there are differences in how the circumpolar current is uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current is moving, and the um, the Antarctic convergence. We talked about this in a previous episode. I don't remember which one, but there is one like. The convergence that uh, could be a nice keyword to find if you're searching. The other reason is that because of climate change, the climate is getting harsher. There is like more extreme events, and we have heard of this everywhere in the globe. And extreme events they stress animals, humans, and albatrosses included. And when the stress hormones go up, then the uh, chances of uh, like irregular behavior or non-typical behavior happen uh, more frequently. So, uh, so that might be also the reason. But both of these uh, reasons, possible explanations, are connected to a warmer climate, and especially warmer waters around around the Falklands and around Antarctica. And that is uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite an piece of news <laughs> but uh, interesting that uh, mm -hmm. like the uh, reproductive success i mean climate change can be a, or any disturbance can have a, a lethal event straight away and then it can have sublethal different levels of sublethal sublethal effects which means that the effects can be seen through either a really careful observation over a long period of time or both or one or the other so in this case 15 years of looking at a thousand pairs of albatross every year, and then you can see the difference. They wouldn't have seen the difference significantly from one year to the other. How do they even do that? I mean, how they does that work scientifically? Well, uh, scientifically, you go and uh, you tag these animals. You ring the albatrosses so it's, with a it's ring. It's all based on their, on their the foot. usual rings that you put on birds' feet. Well, that's that's the that's the traditional way, but it's still the safest way of looking at it. So you go to that colony. Fortunately, the albatrosses they go to the same colony. These albatrosses, at least, they go to the same colony, more or less the same place. So once you ring them once, then with binoculars you can check i mean sitting close by the edge of the colony you can mm -hmm. check which or with a telescope you can check which birds are going together with which other bird so um, it's it's just a question of going in there and ringing the birds and uh, and checking them that's meticulous and doing this meticulous work put it, put it, put it a thousand a thousand pairs a year means 2000 rings that you, <laughs> birds that you that need to, to match ringed. up so somehow wow yeah, but especially going out and, and in the colony and, and checking these birds is not easy. And you usually do it when the birds are very young. I mean, they, when they are before they are fledged. So right. you don't do it with the adults, but you have to be there when the adults are not there 
chasing your way. Okay, let's go back yeah. to the Arctic and talk about ice. Yes. Yeah. Next, then now we are moving north, and uh, this um, this uh, first piece of news is actually linking to what we are talking about uh, uh, with the last episode, episode one four two, and this is about this uh, big Polynia area north of Ellesmere Island. And, uh, and and it's both this item and the next one in the newsreel. Um, the uh, uh, phenomena of warming through inflow of ocean water from the south is called Atlantification. We are talking in the Arctic. And uh, it has an influence on the temperature of the Arctic. So on the left frame here, you see the sea ice thickness. It's a view from a polar view of the uh, of the Earth, where you see the North Pole, and you have different so colors we're, according we're to sea ice thickness. We're looking down straight down on the North Pole, pretty straight much. Down so there's the Greenland, the there's uh, yeah. there's yeah. Svalbard. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the North America and Siberia all around. Iceland, and then yeah. you see like a maximum extent of the sea ice or more or less a maximum extent of sea ice and different colors of thickness. And you can see that the maximum thickness is north of the Canadian archipelago and north of Greenland. Yeah. And uh, and then when the colors fade out into the blue of the ocean and towards the periphery, that's where you have the thinner ice, like a little bit like uh, south of uh, Spitsbergen or yes. around Spitsbergen or, or Svalbard. In the frame on the right, you see the uh, sea ice thickness anomaly. So what has changed in the period between, uh, well, in the last uh, 20 years, uh, more or less, I think uh, it's uh, 2013 to 2020 or so. Uh, 2011 it, to 2020. 2011, yes. yeah. So in the last years, uh, and this is because the technology is very difficult to get sea ice thickness. But uh, you can see that there is a loss of mass or a loss of thickness, especially where we had this Polynia in the last episode. So they were, like, where it goes red north in the graph, Island. Uh, the more red it goes, the more ice yes. has been lost in thickness. Yes. And the and the loss of sea ice is mostly north of the uh, of the uh, Canadian archipelago in Greenland. So in the last ice area that we saw <laughs> in the LIA that we had in the last episode, and also between Northeast Greenland and Spit and Svalbard. Yes. That's also a really big loss of thickness in the ice. And uh, and this is uh, this is actually quite, uh, quite, uh, quite something. And uh, there was a little uh, video maybe you can show this uh, nine, these last nine years, <clears throat> that uh, uh, where so some animation by the to... European Space Agency because they have the satellites up there, so they can look at the data and visualize it. Yep. And uh, this shows how it changes over the years. There's a nice graph here. Yeah, with the, with the season, so starting with uh, with lower thickness and coming up with higher thickness, and you can see that there is a, a big variability between the years. And uh, in the in the sea ice volume that's in the Arctic, but it doesn't it doesn't like this is of course about the sea ice volume, but the sea ice volume is of course it's due to sea ice thickness, thickness, but also the sea ice extent. Yes. So it's uh, there are quite quite interesting parameters there, and uh, and the point of of this article is that when there is uh, ice coming from the North Atlantic into the Arctic, especially through the Fram Strait, we are talking about Atlantification. So the Atlantic Ocean water carries its water to the Atlantic, to the Arctic, and it causes the sea edge, uh, the ice edge to retreat, to uh, retreat up north. So for example, between Svalbard and Northeast Greenland. And, uh, and uh, it makes the, uh, it makes the um, the uh, the ice thickness lower, and this, like when when you measure the ice thickness, I mean measuring sea ice extent, you have to have a satellite or a way of having the coverage of the whole Arctic in a short period of time, and and you can 
kind of see well the ice is going up to this moment uh, to this uh, geographical location up to this line the problem with sea ice thickness is that the traditional way of looking at sea ice thickness is being on site so like once once the ice becomes white and it's compact you have no idea whether like just from looking above and looking at the color of whether it is 20 centimeters thick or 10 meters thick so there is no possibility of doing this uh, the uh, traditional method is of going on site and just uh, making a hole drilling yeah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and measuring drilling a hole through the ice and measuring the thickness and then, of course, there are differences in how dense the ice is, depending on how much uh, uh, salt from seawater is in the ice, how old it is. And this is, this is, of course, also a very safe method of measuring thickness, except when the ice is very non-homogeneous, <laughs> because the ice is not usually totally flat, neither from the top nor from the bottom. But there is... And this is where the new satellites come up. And uh, especially there are two satellites. There are Cryosat and the... Uh, and, well, there are two. The one is called Cryosat and the other, the other one is called SMOS. And uh, they can measure the extent of the ice, but also how high the ice is from the sea level. Hmm. And therefore, by calculating the buoyancy of the ice, they can check how much volume this ice has that is interesting so you can, you can do this uh that precisely That's... from a satellite wow well yeah it i mean it's very specialized satellites but uh but these are um this this is a process that is uh, performed by the alpha wegener institute in the helmholtz in the, in germany mm -hmm. and uh, it has uh, like every week they manage to have a the the uh, the images from both systems and to merge them and to calculate this, which is uh, where we get the volume of the data, the the volume of the ice, the data on the volume. Do, of do the you ice. know how that works? That measurement is that just a distance measurement, like with one yeah, of these it is. one of these remote? I mean, I have one of these remote uh, uh, laser based things that can measure how far the wall, how far away that wall is, and it's quite precise. Yes. So is that similar? <clears throat> Well, it's a similar thing. It's based on uh, on radar uh, more than on laser because uh, the problem with laser is that if you have uh, clouds, you will not see through it. Okay. Yeah, but, I mean, laser will be uh, will be quicker and more precise, and uh, and the uh, the challenges with uh, with radar is about the conditions of the surface of the ice right. and the condition of the surface of the seawater. Uh, storm conditions are, of course, creating less uh, reliable data than so uh, than flats. How, how and often nice do condition. they measure this? What did you say? Well, these are these are um, satellites that are in polar orbit or near polar orbit, so they have to taking they take they they do the calculations every week because mm -hmm. it takes a week for the satellite to take all these swaths over the North Pole. Right. For, like there are slices of the earth coming over the north pole mm -hmm. and as the earth turns around <laughs> uh, on its axis then the satellite uh, so the, the satellites uh, are going another. like this around the poles yeah. and the yes, earth uh, keeps going. spinning under the satellite so you get like different yes. slices for every exact every orbit pretty much for every orbit and and then the mosaics have to be put together and it's right. a it's a lot of data and a lot of data that has to be sent down to earth from a satellite so it's also mm -hmm. it's interesting from the transmission of the data point of view because we are talking about a lot of a lot of data we're talking the terabytes uh, of data probably it's a lot yes of stuff, yes 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 because you don't you don't you normally don't want the satellite to do some pre-processing because the pre-processing of the data takes energy and it takes also the volume of the computer on board has to be yes. increased and the processors. But uh, it's quite uh, quite an interesting system here. And um, and from this, I think that uh, if we go over to the next piece of news, we stay <laughs> in is, the Arctic, which is stay in the Arctic and talking about authentication. And uh, apparently, this authentication has started 
in the 20s, in the 1920s, so 100 What? years ago. So the, uh, the influence of the anthropogenic climate change on, on, uh, on, the, on the Arctic Ocean was postulated to start, uh, well, let's say about 50 years ago or something. But uh, there are some records in the uh, deposits, in the mineral deposits in the Fram Strait, in the isotope ratio, that is in the oxygen isotope ratio, that is in the shells of carbon or the carbon skeletons of some plankton species mm -hmm. that deposits in the Fram Strait, so between Svalbard and, and Greenland, that let us infer that there was a phenomenon of authentication already in the 1920s. So warm water from the Atlantic was flowing into the Arctic Ocean already there. So not Which only did we, did we go up, up there and uh, catch all the whales and stuff, but we also warmed it up in some way. Well, It's, uh, you know, if it's, if you're talking about last time, we're talking about when was the, uh, when was the beginning of uh, the global change. We're talking about the COP26 in Glasgow. And we're saying, okay, already in, at least in the mid 1800s, people were already thinking that maybe burning all that coal would have an influence, mm -hmm. releasing all this uh, CO2 would have an influence on the climate. Well, It did have an influence on the climate. It was enough to have 40, 50, maybe years of intense coal burning that was already having an influence. Who would on have the thought North that Atlantic. we would do something to this planet we live on? <laughs> yes, and uh, but uh, but this is this is really uh, really quite interesting because uh, this means that the the. Um, increase in temperature so the baseline of the temperature of the arctic has to be updated so right. instead of the arctic having warmed let's say one point something degrees it has actually warmed about two degrees because we are going much further back in time to see what was the temperature from which we calculate the change. So we need to have a different baseline. That's what you're saying. Yeah, the baseline has to be put much further <laughs> back. So we're saying the Arctic is actually warming, has been warming more than, than we had imagined. The, the, the Arctic was much colder in the 1700s. And, it, and, it, and, and, and the change the begins to correlate with uh, industrialization. Pretty much. Yeah, it does. It does because, I mean, these are, uh, I mean, from these data, of course, they went back more than the 19, the beginning of the 1900s. You take, uh, you actually go out and take some, some carrots or some samples of the sea bottom uh -huh. where there are the, the shells of the coccolithophores, uh, these carbon, calcium carbonate shells. And, and you see for the, for the oxygen isotope ratio in there. And, uh, The more you have of oxygen 18, so the more you have of the heavy oxygen isotope, the more energy you have in the system, and which means that it is then the uh, a warmer, a warmer climate. And then you can time this with uh, with other data series and uh, and look at the uh, look at the actual temperatures. Hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, and this means as well that the models that have been modeling like. The, uh, the past, like the way we understand the climate is looking at past data and see how the system behaved. Well, here we need to insert some data that the system was actually needs to go and look further back. So hmm. let's see what, uh, what happens. This is a, quite a new article now from the, from the end of uh, 2021, also on FIS.org. And uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's um, interesting to see what this does. But as we are staying with the Arctic and the warming Arctic, let's go on land. <laughs> and uh, yes. from SciTech Daily, we have a reference to uh, studies that are looking at the thawing of the permafrost. And um, 
this is a very nice picture we're seeing of a permafrost in the summer. We see some lakes with still some ice on them, and then we see these fantastic polygonal soils all around. And this is, I is mean, this the very permafrost. Typical? Yeah, it's very typical of the thawing and the refreezing processes on land. So the uh, the edges of the polygons are where the uh, larger stones accumulate so the mm. ice pushes the larger stones out in the uh, in the um, in the periphery and then of course they make this honeycomb or like they're called polygonal so like polygons and um, and of course this happens and as ha has happened every summer every summer the permafrost thaws a little bit on the top because when the snow goes away and the albedo that you were talking about last time mm -hmm allows more energy to come to the soil than the soil thaws on the top. But it's recently going much faster. And uh, and there are, I mean, we are talking about uh, about 23 million square kilometers of permafrost in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's a lot of permafrost. And uh, it's typically soil that has been frozen for about a million year. <laughs> so, so and, uh, and when you are talking about frozen, it's frozen. You have an active layer on the top, which is a layer that thaws and uh, and refreezes in the summer, and All then right. you have the the stable layer going down. It which, can go down. The, the stable quite layer a is lot. the one that is permanently frozen. That's why it's yeah. called permafrost, right? Yeah, yeah. Or well, you can also like the different kinds of there are different kinds of permafrost, and there we go in the science, and we call it in the in jelly salts. So right. like like jelly like uh, like uh, ice uh, and, <laughs> nothing and is as simple as i want it to be <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes and uh and in any case it can go really far down yeah um and uh and when it thaws i mean if it's just the, big, the top of course we're used to having these uh, cycles of thawing and refreezing but when we when the permafrost thaws further down then it actually allows things that are in the depth to be exposed for example to water flow and also to crawl up to the to the surface one, or to the be one exposed. thing the one thing that that comes to mind is the one thing that i've seen a lot in the media is like when they find a woolly mammoth that was frozen and then gets dug out is that the kind of exactly. stuff we're talking about well we are talking also about that kind of stuff and uh, i think there is a picture that identifies a few of the things that come out of the permafrost there's that your one mammoth there. right there so you see your mammoth there and so you have the active layer the permafrost and you see in different colors uh, on the top and you see also the accumulation of water in some lakes and things the mammoth of course they can come out to the surface and it's very quite a common event uh, it's not it's not that rare to get these big large animals coming out they are in more or less a good state of conservation. Um, these are interesting, of course. Well, they are spectacular. Not, I mean, they are spectacular, and all is great. Some people also say that there were times where, like in times of need, one could go and eat some of the meat that was had been frozen for a couple of thousand years, or maybe yeah. about ten thousand years or something. Um, I wouldn't recommend it Mammoth in general. <laughs> It's, yeah, well matured. Um, but the problem there is that there you could get things that were living on that mammoth or maybe even causing its death. And uh, even in the soil, even in the absence of man mammoth, there are viruses, there are bacteria. Like uh, you have heard of... Uh, like uh, the anthrax, for example, mm -hmm. or uh, smallpox viruses and things that can come up in the tundra and can come up on the thermofrost. And if the if this permafrost reduces its extent, and we are talking about uh, about losing quite a significant amount of permafrost, we are saying up to two thirds of the permafrost closer to the surface could be lost by the end of the century. We are talking about a lot of things living or more or less living things that can be released into the atmosphere, into the water circulation. Birds migrating to the Arctic can pick up something and take it down to the subarctic or further south. 
So there's we also stuff have, coming out that shouldn't be coming out. They shouldn't right. be coming out. And we also have some more recent stuff because a lot of chemicals that have been condensing over the Arctic and being deposited and being covered and incorporated in the permafrost. And we're talking about uh, about uh, chemicals uh, that have been man-made and uh, that are have been recognized as non not uh, I mean, a, a non-healthy <laughs> part of the ecosystem. We are talking about persistent organic pollutants. We are talking about even, even like metal uh, mercury or methyl or metal mercury that can be uh, can be found there. And we find also that there are some places where there are some nuclear fallouts, or even especially in uh, in northern uh, Siberia, there are, there are places which are deposits of of nuclear waste. And, oh, so uh, so where they dug uh, mines uh, down there and then put nuclear waste yes. in the permafrost, assuming that yes. it perma meant perma, as in permanent. Yes, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. I mean, there are there are other places where nuclear waste is uh, dug into salt deposits, right. and that's uh, for the moment it's a little bit more stable than <laughs> than than the permafrost. Well, but, but of it course, the permafrost all is... depends on the scale of yeah. time that you're looking at because everything is in motion. And uh, and so much, especially this uh, nuclear waste and the, and the chemicals are so much of a uh, let's say of an emerging problem that uh, that the the Russian government is set up a lot of actions in motion for cleaning up, uh, especially around uh, Novaya Zemlya, for example, mm -hmm. the uh, sites where there have been deposits of uh, of, uh, of nuclear waste. So. What are they doing? Are they going to different sites and digging into more permanent frost? Or well, there are some sites which are well known, and uh, and then you uh, have to dig out these uh, early generation uh, nuclear waste, and huh. uh, it's usually quite uh, quite toxic and quite nauseous and dangerous. And uh, and there are others which are like dumping sites. Uh, last summer, um, there was a scientific expedition that had some. One of its goals was also to try to figure out where a container containing two damaged nuclear reactors from a submarine had been dumped into the sea, and they managed to localize it. So now they know exactly where it is, and then hmm. they are planning on taking this up and taking it to a place that is less uh, that is less prone to corrosion. <laughs> just to mention one thing, and then let's and it see was in how the, many hundred the, years in the, in the future it will come out again. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Well. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. The the Arctic uh, is uh, is an interesting place, and uh, and the thawing of the permafrost is one thing, but also like there are big variabilities, and this takes us to the next article that I wanted to bring up to. Right. Because because there attention. are places where there is too much ice. Right. <laughs> yes, and especially when the ice comes a little bit earlier on now. I don't usually read war cargo news, but there were some some references, in, especially in Norwegian newspapers, about uh, about these things happening. Just small notice, and then I was looking for the most recent information. And we have one from War Cargo News, and then from the Barents Observers. And uh, this year, the northern sea route, so the 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 sea passage we call northeast passage or north of siberia going from europe to asia north of asia passing close north of asia is um is actually freezing up much earlier so it started freezing up already in the uh in the early october and a lot of ships have been caught there a lot of ships compared to the traffic that there is. Of course, this is not the Panama Canal. But if you see this picture of uh, the ice thickness that is provided by the Russian authorities, we can see that uh, now uh, it's also a polar view. You can see in gray the land area. So you see the uh, Asia and Europe. I always have like to reorient because the Russians show the polar view in a different orientation than the Americans well, do yes. or the Canadians do <laughs> and the Europeans do. So now Greenland yeah, exactly. is pointing upwards. Left up Greenland is, poor, is pointing at eleven o'clock, and then we have uh, we have uh, <laughs> Russia way down at uh, at noon, at actually at uh, six o'clock, um, and um, 
and we see different colors. So we have along the shore of Siberia, we have like a purple color. And maybe you can help me, Chris, about the, the yeah. It thickness. says ten to thirty centimeters here. That's the ten purple to thirty color. centimeters. It's it's kind of a, a channel there. And then the next color is green. Yeah, and that's, that's between thirty and two meters, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and that's a very big area of green ice, and especially we can see that the green ice is connecting the very fast ice, which is brown, which is a central polar ice, to the land in a couple of places, and especially the place around Wrangell Island, so on the east of the Northeast Passage, connecting to Chukotka, the uh, Wrangell Island, we have a big ice bridge that is connecting <laughs> the uh, connecting Wrangell Island to and the mainland. And it's an ice bridge of relatively thick ice. Yes. And then we have the difficulty in passing the New Siberian Islands and the Taimir. And uh, and these ships have to be rescued, uh, partly because there are, of course, lives that are at stake. And that's, of course, one of the... <laughs> one so of the, uh, we're talking about ships being frozen in the, in the ice there. Yeah, these are ships that usually are ice uh, reinforced. So they can cope with a little bit of ice, mm. but they couldn't cope with ice up to two meters thickness, which yes. is also something that you need an icebreaker for plowing through. Yeah. So they were caught in there, even a, even a, um, how do you call it, a um, research uh, vessel from, from Russia was, uh, was, um, was caught in, in there. And, uh, and uh, so the, uh, the Russian agency uh, the Rosatom Flot, uh, the uh, Russian agency that is uh, managing the uh, icebreakers, had to send several of the older and newer icebreakers, including the the newest, which is the Arctica, that um, is uh, has come out as early as possible up to rescue these ships. And to rescue a ship out of the ice takes time. You cannot take all of the ships at once usually because the icebreaker can plow a channel, but the ice blocks out again after one. The ships do not have brakes, so it's very difficult going in a convoy and breaking the ice because the icebreaker at times has to like stop, retreat, and ram the ice and come up on the ice and break it. So it is not a constant speed, uh, the breaking of the ice, so you cannot really have a convoy and then tell the people in the back, like, watch so, out, don't So you have a time me. window between when the icebreaker breaks the ice and when the ice closes back up yes. again behind the icebreaker. Doesn't yes. sound easy. And you have to pass into this channel. And these channels are also quite filled with chunks of ice. Of course. Which are... Like if you have a chunk of ice as big as a small car, it's probably a couple of tons of weight. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you don't so want if, that to bang into your ship side. If your ship is not enough reinforced, you have to be very careful in pushing these things to the side. Yes, in general, you don't plow at high speed through no. a field with the ice. Even if it has been broken by an icebreaker, you have to be going slowly and push the ice away out of your path. Oh. And uh, as a... Um, as a last uh, little thing before we finish off, I had uh, uh, found this a uh, YouTube video uh, and uh, like the list of the um, of the of the icebreaker. This is Yamal, which is one of the big uh, um, nuclear icebreaker that is plowing through the ice. We can see a video of the uh, bow of the ship with the searchlight because of course we are in the winter and uh, it's dark most of the time and uh, to see how it does it i mean the amal is very big and quite powerful so you need a large ship and a, a powerful engine because you need to push the ship up on the ice and crush it with the weight of the ship and the weight so can this be also one increased is, by this one is nuclear powered water this is nuclear powered, so it can operate continuously as far as uh, the humans can do it. And uh, it, uh, with small ice, it just breaks it without stopping. And thicker ice, it needs to come on top of and then break it with its weight. And it, as I, I was mentioning before, that it can increase its weight by pumping more water into some ballast in the hull. 
so to make itself heavier and that takes even this is more amazing pictures then, these are really amazing yeah. pictures with, with all the ice on the ship and that that probably yeah. adds to the weight of the ship as well so it does it does it can be extremely dangerous yeah. icing yeah. is yeah. extremely yeah. dangerous but you can see here that uh, the yamal went uh, close to a cargo vessel with containers it approached it and it hooked it up a little bit like with a tow hitch on a car and wow. it took it up behind it and it's just pulling it away and pulling it through the ice and uh, taking it out with a beautiful sight in there yeah. so this is uh, this is something that uh, requires uh, quite a lot of expertise and uh, a lot of uh, I say resources. I I remember. I, I remember. Um, I was on the Norderlicht once, uh, crossing from Norway up to Svalbard, and that was in winter, and that was it, it was a constant battle against the ice building up on the ship. So you had to go out yeah. a couple of times a day with a big wooden hammer and bang against the hull to 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 get rid of the ice that was forming because that would make the ship too heavy and to hard to maneuver to top heavy, and to top heavy yeah. pretty much yeah so mm -hmm. so that was a constant fight and just being in that environment permanently um and having to crash through the ice is wow yeah it is uh it is not for just about everybody to <laughs> it was an adventure to navigate in the in the winter in icing condition true adventure and, uh, and it's a, it's true adventure, and it is it is actually uh, one of the messages or one of the warnings that you have in the Norwegian coastal forecast or weather forecast for for um, uh, for the ships is the danger of uh, icing on deck, right? Because that of course is uh, is quite dangerous. It usually happens when you have a lot of spray coming on deck and, uh, and these yeah. are conditions where it's not safe to go out one uh, just as a piece of trivia uh, the uh, some ships for example the uh, norwegian coast guard uh, vessel uh, called uh, svalbard uh, has uh, heating on the on the deck oh okay so it can use heat from the engine or from additional heaters to uh, to heat up the um, to heat up the uh, the deck and therefore melt the ice and this works up to a certain temperature because when you go below a certain temperature you you need you need a hull to be really really hot <laughs> it also needs fuel <laughs> and energy and uh it exactly. takes away from from the energy that you can use to propel the ship yes and, and then, you do not have course. geothermal like uh like Reykjavik who they have uh, heated sidewalks so Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here in in Norway, maybe you've seen that that you have heated sidewalks as well, but these are with electricity and they are produced with hydropower, hydroelectric power, <laughs> which, which, because which, Norway had uh, has for the moment quite a lot of. But yeah, hydropower. But it's it's amazing <laughs> that uh, you walk around the cities here in Tromsø, for example, and uh, and the sidewalks are heated, are heated, Some and and full of lava in some places at least. Yes. All right. Um, I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, I guess we'll be back, well, at least once more before Christmas. And uh, Mario, thank you so much for putting this together. It's always a pleasure. You're welcome. It's always um, a pleasure for me to do that. And thanks even, for the chat, Chris. Even though some sometimes these topics are a bit of doomy gloomy, but, um, well, we're doing our best to keep it light. We'll be back soon. Until then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Take care.